Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leader series, Recent Advances in Structural Health Monitoring in Australia. My name is Megan Purdy and I'll be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to Elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that today's webinar has been hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, the Queensland University of Technology, QUT. QUT is a major Australian university with global reputation and a real world focus. Its courses equip the students and graduates with the skills they need for the world of today and tomorrow. They are an ambitious institution with a rapidly growing research output focused on technology and innovation. Well known for their strong links to industry and government, the high impact of their research, which involves multidisciplinary teams, can be seen across areas as diverse as climate change mitigation, digital media, material science, and biomedical innovation. Today, we'll hear from our keynote speaker, Professor Tommy Chan, followed by a panel discussion and then an audience q and I would like, now like to welcome our moderator for today, Dr. Ronan Nguyen. Ronan is an ARC DECA Research Fellow in the School of Civil Environmental Engineering at QUT. He has over 10 years of experience in structural health monitoring. Please join me in welcoming Ronan Nguyen. Thank you, Megan, and welcome again to our viewers. Now I would like to welcome our keynote speakers, Professor Tommy Chen. Professor Tommy Chen is a full professor of civil engineering in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Queensland University of Technologies. He is also the founding chair and president of the Australian Network of Structural Watering or ANSAM. Professor Chen has been actively involved in carrying out research on structural monitoring and has over 20 years of experience in structural monitoring of various significant long span bridges in Hong Kong and mainland China. So please join me in welcoming Professor Tommy Chen. So thank you so much, Megan, for your introduction. So uh, the title for my presentations today is Recent Advances of Structural Health Monitoring. So I would just like to make the acknowledgement of traditional owners. So QUT acknowledges the Turbo and Yagawa as the First Nations owners of the lands where QUT now stands. We pay our respects to their cultures and to their elders and laws. We recognize that these lands have always been places for teaching, research, and learning. QUT acknowledges the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QUT community. So the topic for today is recent advances of structural health monitoring. Actually, there are different definitions about structural health monitoring and people may, because of different definition, they may have different expectation of structural health monitoring. So before I go on any further to describe about recent advances, I just like to go back to the uh, original to see what structural health monitoring is and what should it be. So about uh, 10 or 11 years ago, I added a book together with Professor David Van Beretnam. In the chapter one of this book, I have given a definition for structural health monitoring as the use of own structure sensing system to monitor the performance of the structure and evaluate its health state. So it could be seen that structural health monitoring is not only damage detection. A lot of the time for the researcher, they most often consider 
damage detection is equivalent to structural health monitoring, but actually it is not. Structural health monitoring is not equivalent to damage detection. For a proper structural health monitoring, there should be two main components. The first is about to monitor the performance of the structure. And the second one is to evaluate its health state. Then later, I was invited by the Australian standards to draft the session on structural health monitoring in AS5100, the bridge design standard. So in that standard, I redefined the structural health monitoring as SHM involves the use of various sensing devices and ancillary system to monitor the in situ behavior of a structure to assess the performance of the structure and evaluate its condition. Comparing the two definitions, it could be found out that in the latest definition, I realized that structural health monitoring is not only describing this, the sensing system installed on a structure. We could have off-structure sensing system. So because of that, I deleted the word on structure sensing system. Instead, I stated as the use of various sensing devices together with ancillary systems. And this time, I still have the two main components for the structural health monitoring, which include to assess the performance of the structure and evaluate its condition. So these are the two main components for a proper SHM system. And also, I include something like to monitor the in situ behavior of a structure. So all these sensing systems, basically, they are used to monitor the in situ behavior of a structure. So having that in mind, so we could roughly you know that what you should expect for the structural health monitoring. So I would like to describe to you basically what are the aims and application for SHM. So regarding the aims of an SHM, so the first one is, is Try to ensure safe structures. The second one, to obtain rational and economic maintenance planning. The third is to attain safe and economic operation. And the fourth is to identify causes for unacceptable responses. So from these four aims, it could be seen that the safe structures could be ensured using the SHM system. And we also could use the SHM system to provide rational and economic maintenance planning. And then we should also try to use the system to attain safe and economic operation. So in other words, SHM is not necessary to be installed to a structure when that structure is at risk. A lot of the time, when a new, new constructed structure, we could use the SHM to attain safe and economic operation. So if we have an SHM system on a structure, 
it not necessary means that the structure is at risk. That is something that we need to be clear on. And then if something goes wrong, SHM can help to identify causes for unacceptable responses. And how about its applications? We could use SHM to verify the design. When we are talking about design verification, it includes the responses for the design as well as the assumption of the design. Most often, when an engineer they have conducted the design and have it being built. Then it just seems that it's already be a successful task they have completed. But actually, with the SHM installed on a structure, we could validate or verify our design assumption as well as to see if the structure is behave what we expect. All these data are important for future design. So with the SHM system, we could have more and more economic and effective design in the future. A lot of the time as an engineer, we consider that we try to incorporate better of safety for uncertainties. But if we have SHM system for some typical structures, then we are more certain for the behavior as well as for the assumption of the structure. Then when we design another similar structure, we know better and we could have more, more economic design and safer design because of the SHM. And also, we could help to maintain and manage the, our asset properly using the SHM system. We rely only on those whistle inspection. They could be helpful. But if we are having the SHM, we could have to inspect or to know where the damage is and as well as what causing the damage, especially for some part of the structure, which may be not easy to be assessed or they may be covered by something like other structures, other structural component. So it could help for to maintain maintenance planning more economically. And also it could say, provide safety provisions and troubleshootings. And also as structural health monitoring, the term it implies, it could help to provide monitoring system or the structure. So having no own the aims and applications of the SHM system, we, now we know that SHM is not just to install sensors. A lot of people misconcept that SHM is just to install sensors here and there and everywhere, and that will be what SHM is. To me, I consider that it's just waste of money. So basically for SHM system, for very complicated or sophisticated uh, uh, system that could achieve the aims mentioned here. It could be only less than 5% of the construction cost, but it could help to give all that I mentioned earlier. The main thing is we need to have a proper SHM system so that we could collect the data from the census. So the data collector to make the data collected from the census to make sense is something that we need to be ensure. Okay, now we may come to the SHM Research and Development at QUT. 
So at QT, we have a very big team to work on SHM. So I would like to acknowledge all these investigators and supervisors of the SHM system together with these uh, uh, mm, former students or uh, the research staff at the moment. So these is a lot of them, they have already got their PhD through their project on SHM. So when we are talking about SHM research, there should be three areas that we need to work on. The first one is system development. As I keep on stressing, SHM is not only to install sensors here and there. SHM is trying to help the data collected from the sensors to make sense. So system development mainly is to deploy the sensors so that it could be helpful to monitor your structure, to monitor its performance as well as its operation. So this is a very important part. So a lot of the time we can see from a lot of incidents that incorrect deployment of sensors, just wasting money, and you will have a lot of data to analyze. So it is important for you to consider where to deploy the sensor so that it could give you the best information. So this is related to system development. And then the next is the research and development activity is on sensors and measurements. In the market, there are a lot of commercial sensors, but maybe some of the sensors, they may not be working as what we expect because most of the, those sensors they are developed by, developed by E and M expert and SHM is a multidisciplinary field. It is important for civil engineer to give what they expect from the sensors what they would like to measure so that we could tailor made the sensors for the SHM system. So acuity, we also work on that. And then regarding the application, which is also very important because it's, SHM is not just to install the sensors, to develop the sensor. We also like to help the sensors to make sense. So we would, there are different methods we work on to meet the aim of the SHM as well as it can help to monitor the performance of the structure and uh, evaluate its health state. So these are the area that applications will work on. So we started the SHM as early as 2007. And now it's almost 15 years after we start our SHM study at QUT. We have a number of projects and earlier you could see that we have delivered a number of PhDs. So it is not easy to describe all of them within this presentation. So I just selected 20 of them, which cover as an example of the system development, sensor and measurements and applications. So there will be two projects regarding the system development and three projects regarding the sensors and measurements, and then 15 projects about applications. So Altogether, I selected 20 projects.
Okay, regarding the system development, that is how we deploy the sensors, etc. So, one of them is since I am an expert on SHM and I'm working at QT, so I would like to have one of our, our building to be installed with the SHM system. So I selected the P block at our QT Garden Point campus, which is called the QUT Science and Engineering Center. And it considered to be the five star green mm, mm, green star uh, rating for that P block. So in the P block, we installed the three system there, which include vibration, which is accelerometer base uh, or acceleration base, and structural, which is the string base and subspace subsurface monitoring. So we just try to make use of this build P block as our living laboratory. So we are so excited to tell our students while we are lecturing at P block, telling them that you are quite safe in the structure because this structure, this building, we are having the structural health monitoring installed. And we are just trying to work on so that its in situ behavior could be shown in the what we call the cubed area for the students. So it will could be quite attractive when students come in for the open day to see how the structure behavior behave and how they drum on the structure and see what will be it respond. So this is one of the system development. You can see that from that system development. Normally, I mentioned earlier, we need 5% for the construction cost to have a SHM system to give information for the asset owner to manage and maintain their asset. But for that P block, because of our careful development and design, so the SHM system only cost 200K for the SHM system. It is, so for that, and you can see that for that five-star green, uh, green star rating, it only to be less than 0.1% of the total cost. So you could see that less than 0.1%, we could have an SHM system. And then the other one regarding the system development, I would like to introduce is the one that QT working with Rockville. So Rockville, oh, oh, they are quite a, a one of the pioneers uh, on the SHM systems. I think around 10 years ago, they take an initiative to work with us for a project to have the real-time SHM system for post-disaster decision in bridges. In so what we try to do is we try to see if we could have some SHM system to install on a structure which is prone to be attacked by flooding or wind just like what we call the extreme event. And then after that, how quickly we can tell the public that it is safe or not to tell the public, to tell the asset management team that it is safe to be, be open again. So this system is quite useful for the assets manager. Okay, then, we come to the projects for census and measurement. I selected three of them. The first one I would like to describe is the IMCLC project collaborating with Monitum. So this IMCLC project is that we develop what we call the Kulu technology. 
So Kulu is a, a, a bird. Kulu is an Aboriginal name for a kind of bird. And these could help using the global navigation satellite system to obtain the static displacement in three dimensions within the accuracy within few mm. So it after the development, it has been used to measure sea wall displacement, slope deformation, etc. So later I could see it, I will describe one of the application project is how we could use this low cost GNSS device to measure the displacement for monitoring. Okay, the second one regarding the sensor and measurement is using FPG base to measure the displacement. FPG base is what we call the optical fiber sensors. Optical fiber sensors is a very unique type of sensors because it could be used as a sensor as well as the transmit media and, and also it is ENM immutable as well as it is it will provide digital data rather than analog data and because of these unique features we developed some measurement techniques so that we could measure the vertical displacement of a structure. A lot of the time, it is not easy to measure the vertical displacement of a, a bridge. But using that optical fiber sensors, we are able to obtain the displacement or even the defective shape of a structure. And also, we could make use of the unique features of the optical fiber sensors to develop some sensitive accelerometers. So for traditionally, for the accelerometers, the inertial optic will be the same direction of the movement. But we try to make use of the unique features of the optical fiber sensors to develop an accelerometer, which with the inertial optic perpendicular to the optical fiber sensors. And through that, the um, acceleration response could be amplified a lot. So we are able to develop that. And the PhD student working in this area, after he developed some accelerometers, now he has a very good business in China to Develop uh, uh, to supply this kind of accelerometers. Okay, so you have seen two projects on the um, system development and three projects for the sensors and measurements. Now I'm going to show you applications. So because of the time, I can't describe all that in details, and also I can't describe all of them. So I just selected fifteen of them. So basically, seven projects, they are what we call the structural condition assessment. That is one component of the SHM to evaluate its health state. And the other one, the other eight is regarding the, uh, the system that could help you assess the performance. Okay, so these are the seven projects regarding the health status assessment. So the first one is, you, when you look at that, you can see that it is uh, um, very much like the story bridge here in Brisbane. So actually it is, it is a laboratory model. We try to model that to model the story bridge using mm, an fabricate that in our laboratory. And based on that, we have developed some method to detect the damage. 
Now, after the COVID, I think a lot of you are familiar with the term called false positive or false negative. Regarding the damage detection, it is also important to eliminate all the false positive. False positive, that means that we consider there are damages on the structure, but actually they are not. And false negative is we consider there is no damage, but actually there is. So false positive is annoying. False negative is danger. It's dangerous. So we try to eliminate all that. So one of the methods we use, we call all it um, like a motor strain energy correlation method. It is in specifically for truck structure. And then after we have developed some index to determine the damage, so one of the index, we call it modal strain energy eigen ratios. Then the next is we try to use optimization to help us to eliminate those false positive and false negative index. And then we adopt what we call the genetic algorithm for doing that. Regarding the beam type structures, we develop some method to use the static deflection, which we find that static deflection could be very useful to identify the damage of a structure. The only problem is it's not easy to measure the static displacement. But I have mentioned earlier, we have made use of the optical fiber sensors for such measurement. So which make this method very effective to determine, to identify damage for a beam type structures. Then the next one is when we have some structure, there may be some mask, especially for onshore or off offshore platform. A lot of the old structures, there will be a change of mass, but those change of mass could mask the actual damage. So what we develop, we call it modal kinetic energy, which could help to identify the damage of a structure, even with mass loss. So these are some examples of that. So as, uh, again, I won't go into details because of the time. And also we have developed what we call the uh, damage in our uh, base index for slap on girder bridge using modal flexibility and modal strain energy damage index. And then we also use this kind of development, but we can separate, distinguish them for the vertical mode and the natural mode. And then we use multi-criteria uh, uh, assessment to apply it for a symmetric building. And we use similarly, for this kind of modal feasibility in, in method, but we modify that for arch type structures and modified modal strain energy in, in method. Again, we try to separate the natural and the vertical mode, and then we find it very effective to detect damage for arch bridges. Regarding the Mass change, temperature change will also be an important feature that we should look into, especially for cooling tower. So we developed a, a, some method to detect damage in hyperbolic cooling tower using the vibration characteristics. Regarding the performance monitoring, you can see that we have it's state here. Uh, six purposes, but 
regarding the pre-stressed force identification, we develop three methods. So a lot of the time for the pre-stressed force identification of an existing bridge is something that engineer always would like to work on and to estimate. And we have developed three methods for that. So the first one, we call it the synergic identification. So the synergic identification is we try to identify the pre-stress force as pseudo-low coefficient. And we use some moving force to move on it to amplify the vibration or the responses. And this method could, a, could be able to identify both the moving force and the pre-stress load. So we call it the synergic identification. And then we can use system identification and we simulate the bridge structure as a plate of, and then we are able to apply that system identification method to identify the pre-stress force as one of the parameters to be identified. The third method we use to identify the pre-stress force is to use the ultrasonic wave phase. And we just use some ultrasonic a, a transmitter and receiver. And then when it goes through the pre-stress force, because of the stress that it comes across, it will give some signal regarding the force. And by analyzing the ultrasonic wave, we are able to identify the pre-stress force of it. And a lot of time, the asset owner will always like to know the load carrying capacity. So we developed a method. Instead of using wheel vehicle, we call it virtual load testing on the structure. And through that, we are able to determine its load carrying capacities. And we even use a a box girder and fail that and try to use it to validate what we developed. And then we mentioned earlier that we use the pre block. So, because of a lot of uncertainties, which come up to have a calibrated model, but now we could make use of the SHM data and keep updating the model and we are able to obtain that calibrated model and we even, we could call it the digital train of the structure. And using that, we developed some method for us to find out the deterioration of a structure and then from the de 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 deterioration that we identify, we are able to determine when is the best time to provide some um, maintenance work to be done on the structure, which could help a structure to extend its original design life. And I mentioned earlier, using the technology, we can use the machine learning method to obtain the settlement of a structure, which will be very useful in a construction site because we don't have to do the land surveying in by manually so uh, it could be quite safe by putting those kulu device there and then we are able to find out the settlement of it and also i mentioned earlier that a lot of time before if we use the shm system properly that could help to ensure the remaining life of a structure so you can see that these hot vivid steel bridge structures if just based on the design, then the fatigue life will be much less if we use the actual vehicle loading and the actual strain we measure from the SHM system. And it could give us the better indication of the life of the structure. Okay, so this is another for uh, a big project that we are working on. So this is, the funding is supplied by the Australian Research Council. The Australian Research Council, they, they provide almost 5 million Australian dollars and the 
we have the industrial partners contributing the cash for around uh, trade up for around mm, seven million, and together with four universities, we have that research hub. And this research hub, we call it the resilient intelligent and infrastructure systems. So we try to use it. There are five themes and SHM system of which I am the chief investigator. I am the leader with the uh, Professor Bridget Samani. So that project, that hub has just been established in Yunnan, and we look forward to its deliverable. Okay, so regarding the SHM system, so you can see it here in the uh, SHM in the Australian Centre, 5100 past seven. So these are the main content of SHM. But you could see that a lot of the topic people are, may not be familiar with. Engineers, when they graduate, they may not have the training background for SHM system. So because of that, we are happy to provide workshops to the industry to help them better understanding the SHM six sessions in the Australian Standard 5100 past seven. So when I'm talking about we, I'm saying, speaking that as the president of Australian Network of Structural Health Monitoring. So the Australian Network of Structural Health Monitoring, in soft form, we call it ANSOM. Basically, it's to promote and advance the field of structural health monitoring in Australia. We try to help to coordinate and integrate efforts for better development application of SHM technique in Australia to showcase achievement and exchange ideas and disseminate knowledge nationally and internationally, and to promote and facilitate national and international collaborative research and development and to raise general community awareness on the need for the for and value of SHM research and applications. So in Ansem, we have 56 organizations, members from 56 organizations, which include 21 universities, 27 mm, mm, private companies, six government authorities, and two research institutes. So you can be seen that, so we have organized a number of workshops that could help to the engineers as well as the public to know better about SHM. And not only that, you could see it here, even during COVID, we still can't stop us to have the workshop. We can have it online. And then we have a lot of publications. So basically we have published more than, I think around 10 special issues and two books. And also we have our quarterly newsletter. And we, because of, of the effort of the uh, ANSOM, so now we have more and more structures with the SHM system. As I mentioned earlier, for the uh, engineers, for in the past, there is no course on SHM, but ANSOM tried to promote courses within universities. So now we have more graduates with knowledge of SHM. And we, we even help to develop that design standard on SHM. So this is one of the, the second books we published in July. So a few months ago, we published that basically we have 11 chapters and that could be divided into five clusters. The first one is about physical model base updating and damage detection for bridges and building. And then the second cluster mainly is talking about how smart and mobile sensor network for bridges and possibly some emerged structure. And then cluster three is about data driven machine learning and in base SHM. As I mentioned earlier, SHM for the application, a lot of time we try to develop some parameters that are sensitive to damages or anomalies. And then we try to develop some tools 
like machine learning to help to identify better or to uh, see how the dam uh, how we could identify the damage and then we also have applied the shm system for where we track maintenance and management so this is the fourth cluster and the fifth cluster cluster is about the digital twin and approach for shm so today you have learned about the shm system so if you are interested more or to know more you are welcome to the forthcoming our 14th annual workshops so each year we organize our annual workshop so the next one is 24th and 25th so the registration is free it will be in sydney but you could also attend it remotely online so please use that qr code and to assess the free registration but please do it before 18th of november Okay, so thank you so much. So I may go a little bit quick on the uh, SHM projects, on these 28 SHM projects. If you would like to know more about all that, you could use that QR code here to assess my publication. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Tommy, for your insightful presentation uh, to open for our discussion today. Uh, so before we get into the formalities, uh, I would like to welcome our panel uh, members who will be joining Tommy. We will have uh, each of our panelists provide a quick overview of themselves and how this topic resonates with them before we move into our panel discussion. So first of all, I would like to welcome Dr. Toro Pep, Director of Structural Design, Review and Standards from Queensland Department of Transport and Mandroves. Hi everyone. So as I've just been introduced, I'm a director in TMR's engineering and technology branch. I look after um, standards design and engineering reviews from the structures division. Um, my passion is in the management of assets to get the best out of them as much as safe as, and as is safe to do so. Uh, and the good thing is, is that TMR's had a long history of monitoring its bridges and we're on a continual improvement journey to find new ways to implement this technology to augment and support our decision making with evidence um, and i'm really looking forward to the panel discussion today thank you thank you Dora. um i now like to welcome dr eugene quay structural engineering advisor from major road projects victoria thanks for having me and good afternoon online audience i work at the major road project victoria as a structural engineering advisor my role provides structural engineering advice on the planning, design, and delivery issue for high-risk major road infrastructure project in Victoria. Uh, for someone who don't know the major road project Victoria, major road project Victoria is a dedicated uh, government body charged with planning and delivery major road project for Victoria. The project includes new road and bridges, road and bridge widening, and major freeway upgrade, which will reduce congestion and travel time, improve safety and connect community. Why this topic is important for my views, structural health monitoring system help evaluating and monitoring structural performance, especially for high risk and critical risk structure. It also uh, could provide real-time monitoring and early warning for the user. However, it is important that structural health monitoring user or owner always need to know what they want to achieve and what outcome they want from the structural health monitoring system. If the structural health monitoring system uses it correctly on the structure, it gives a lot of benefits such as lock, improve safety, reduce maintenance, and increase longevity for the structure. Looking forward to have that panel discussion later on. Thanks, Roman. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, next, I'm pleased to uh, welcome Isaac Scott, Contracts and Structures Services Managers from Brisbane City Council. Thank you, Ronan, and good afternoon, all. Um, so yes, I'm one of the managers in Brisbane City Council. 
Uh, my role is uh, Contracts and Structures Services Manager. In Council, we maintain about 4,000 different civil assets. Um, and where structural health monitoring, monitoring really comes onto our radar is for our historical bridges. So uh, seven of the bridges that we maintain uh, and own as Brisbane City Council are Cross River bridges built in the 1930s. And the most iconic of those is the Story Bridge. And so as we um, wish to continue to have these bridges in service and provide those critical transport links, uh, one of the things we need to understand is uh, what is the residual life of these structures? How safe are they? Uh, and what are the most effective and the cost effective maintenance plans going forward? So that's our main focus. I think one thing I'll admit is that Brisbane City Council doesn't use SHM uh, to any extensive level, but we do have a very targeted approach to how we do use it. Uh, and so that's probably a quick summary of um, uh, Council's approach to SHM uh, as an asset owner uh, seeking to identify the residual life of our structures and also to verify uh, theoretical analysis on the performance of our structures. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac, for your introduction. Uh, I would like now to welcome Dr. Kovinda Bendy, CEO of Rockview Technologies Australia. Please. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Ronan, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Rockfield is a professional engineering services business with a strong background in computational mechanics. Personally, I got inspired by the application of SHM on a number of major bridges in Japan, some of which I was fortunate to have had opportunities to visit during my stay in Japan. At Rockfield, uh, we started instrumentation primarily to validate our final element models. We then got excited about the potential of SHM in damage detection, uh, primarily for sort of post-disaster decision support, uh, for instance, after a flood event. We then started collaborating with the universities, including QUT, as Tommy just mentioned, and other research organizations such as CSR or Data61 to develop tools and techniques to achieve that. But once we started engaging with the end users, as previous speakers uh, mentioned, we realized that the major challenge with public infrastructure assets, it's not so much about damage detection, but more about managing risks associated with uh, critical and non-compliant assets. As we all know, 70% um, of our bridge assets in Australia are more than 50 years old. And over that period, the live loads have changed, structures have degraded, and design standards have become more and more stringent. So after receiving this feedback, we started tailoring and uh, leveraging um, uh, modern sensor technologies, cloud computing, and user interface to draw that real-time insights uh, required for, for asset management and load rating purposes. So it has been an incredible journey uh, for us so far uh, to have this opportunity to get involved in, in, um, in a number of SHM projects across Australia. And also, this has been a very rewarding uh, one as well uh, to see the community impact through the adoption of this technology. So as a practitioner, I believe we are simply scratching the surface with SHM, uh, with the rapid adoption of IoT, digital twins, and industry 4.0 technologies. I believe we are at the cusp of creating a vibrant SHM ecosystem in Australia. Looking forward to the uh, panel discussion. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Govinda. Um, I would like to welcome our final panelist, Peter Runcy. CEO of Natira's Consulting Services. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Ronan, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is a, a great, you know, a great subject uh, topic to be discussing um, at this time. Uh, SHM has been around for for a little while now, and we've heard from Tommy earlier today about you know some of the history there. Um, it really is moving to a point where um, it's going to help us manage our asset base. Um, in the context of, um, you know, organisational strategies and, and things like resilience. So my, my background is more on the digital and data side. Uh, my experience with um, SHM started with a research project um, which resulted in, I think it's probably Australia's largest SHM installation on the Sydney Harbour Bridge where we have some 3,200 sensors uh, installed um, to monitor the bridge and, and provide early detection. Of damage. Uh, there's been quite a lot of learnings on the way uh, and then um, and I think today we could talk a little bit about you know how we look at structures in relationship to the environment around them uh, when we're looking at resilience, understanding 
you know, what else can we be finding out about bridges to complement the SHM systems that are in place? So um, I think that'll be an interesting discussion. Uh, and also looking at what are some of the obstacles or some of the considerations to, uh, to allow organisations to take the technology up. So there's some uh, meaty discussion there over the next uh, 40 minutes. Thanks, Ronan. Thank you, Peter, again. So uh, we, we, we will now move into our discussion on today's topic. So we will take questions from you, our audience. So please ask your question via the chat box and who your question is directed to. So the first topic we would like to discuss is about development and application of structural monitoring. So I may start with you, Toro. So Professor Tommy Chen mentioned his total important roles of structural monitoring in uh, monitoring structural performance. So can you share some of your project where you are employing monitoring system? Sure. Where do I start, really? I think, as I said before, TMRs had a long history of Im implementing structural health monitoring or monitoring systems um, and deriving the value to supplement our decision making. Um, it's taken many different forms, so a couple of things that I could rattle off. Uh, we've been looking at things like um, monitoring things like our halving joints on our networks and seeing how they perform. Um, we put instrumentation on some of our critical assets to see uh, how they perform, what's the demand over them, and then how we make decisions based on that. Uh, we look at things like construction impacts on our existing assets. Um, and one of the more topical ones that's come into my field of view just in the last little while is um, when we have big heavy loads moving around on our network and we want to just val validate and verify that our structures are performing as we expect and that they are safe, not only for the passage of these really heavy loads, but um, everything that comes after them as well. <clears throat> uh, and we employ a range of different sensors. We look at strain gauges, deflection, temperature. Um, we're starting to branch out into things like um, lots of different types of technology as well, so cameras and how that augments our decision making for specifically on bridge monitoring. Um, and also to give a shout out to some of the research that we're doing in this space as well. So we've been doing some work with um, the National Assets Centre of Excellence, so our group, and we've got a couple of different projects where we've been looking at how we can um, further enhance our decision making in terms of way in motion systems uh, in collaboration with our connection to our bridge <coughs> monitoring sites that we've got around. So we've got quite a diverse range um, and not a fans, but I won't because I'll let some of our other panellists talk about what they're also doing in this space as well. So just scratching the surface. Thank you, Tom. Uh, um, talk about what you want to, what that might, you might have in your systems, in your network. So, um, Toro, you, you mentioned some uh, sensors on your structures like strain gate, accelerometers, right? So most of the time mm -hmm. people obtain the data, acquire the data, and they don't know what to do with the data. So can you share some, can you give a bit more information how the data is telling you about and how, how you are using the data practically? Yeah, sure. Um, well, just in recognition that this, uh, the monitoring data that we get is a tool um, and that we employ a range of different uh, methods and, and technology and data to help us make decisions um, and also evidence-based decisions. I think that's one of the best things that I can highly recommend about bridge monitoring. It's giving us evidence to make informed decisions and give us that balance. Um, so maybe just to give some examples. Um, so uh, Isaac mentioned before that there was um, talk about remaining useful life. Um, I don't think we're, there's obviously things like damage quantification and things like that, but I think one of the things we've started looking at is, um, uh, I guess there's fatigue aspects um, and trying to capture data about when is enough for our structures and you know what's when we're looking at low cycle fatigue for some of these high stress cycles as well. So we're capturing data on that. Um, Obviously, that, um, that demand versus asset performance is a key one for us. So we're capturing information about how our assets perform. But one of the key things that we've got to remember on the other side of our equation is what are the loads impacting um, our bridges or our infrastructure? 
so we like want to know well what's the demand look like where are these vehicles traveling for us um, how frequently how are they loaded are they driving as they say they should so we're using these sorts of pieces of information to give us um, visibility on compliance and enforcement that we've been taking forward to say this is not what their permit said that they were going to do and so how do we capture that um, and I just mentioning that also we're looking at um, revalidating some of the assumptions so when we're implementing a design we want to make sure that it's doing as we expected um, and so we're using some of the data in monitoring to just validate some of these things or to even just uh, confirm the assumptions in our assessments or um, even the decision that we've made. So we might be making a decision not to strengthen our bridges based on data and we get the data to validate our position, which has a knock-on effect in terms of saving dollars. Um, and there's knock-on effects in terms of when you've got monitoring systems on, I think there's a, an element of Big Brother is watching. Um, which is certainly we can see have evidence to show that that's having an impact on how our network is operating and we can work with people on that basis to say we just we just want to keep our network safe and operating um, that benefits all thanks Ronan. yeah thank you thank you a lot Toro um, actually Toro mentioned about the project uh, on the vertical line of uh, story bridge which is I think main, the main project of Isaacs so Isaac, can you share some experience from managing the story bridge? You have any problem with that or it's just sure. straightforward? Yes, yeah, please. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, in 2015, I took on the role of a, a senior engineer for councils uh, cross river bridges. And I found that one of the uh, conversations that, were, what, that was coming up fairly constantly with asset managers uh, was around how long is the story bridge going to be around? And there's different views on that. There's asset accounting views, which can be quite different to asset engineering views. And so I thought, well, look, I think we, we need to do some work to get an answer for this. And so the first thing we did was uh, an FEA analysis through a consultant. And so there was a, a theoretical uh, life for the bridge and it's predominantly a steel structure. There's about 100,000 square meters of steel on the structure as a, um, and not encased in concrete. And so, uh, so our main interest was in fatigue life uh, obviously, corrosion is a big factor as well in the life, but we can manage that through our maintenance plans and, and visual inspections. So uh, I guess to cut a long story short, we got a theoretical assessment done. The fatigue life assessment identified quite hundreds of members uh, as being well past their fatigue life. Now, being an engineer on site, on the construction side of things, I, I did not believe that to be right. Uh, and so we, we did visual inspections and you know assessments, and there was no signs of fatigue failure, but obviously you know, what's visible to the naked eye or to certain tools is not necessarily the case. So we then implemented quite a targeted approach to SHM uh, using about 124 gauges in fairly specific locations um, and uh, look for a couple of things. One is the actual behavior of the loads and stresses throughout various critical members of the bridge um, uh, over two weeks of uh, sort of real life loading. Uh, and also we were looking at the dynamic amplification. So the aim of that was to test the theory around a few, so there's always going to be uncertainties in our systems, no matter how good they are, including the assumptions we make using our standards uh, and our uncertainties can lead to probably a lot of conservatism using our standards as well. And so we wanted to, I guess, uh, identify those sources of uncertainty and reduce the uncertainty as much as we could, uh, as much within our control. So. Some of those things was around the actual load parts. You know, the story bridge was designed in the 1930s on with ink and paper, as opposed to um, you know CAD drawings or FAE. So FEA. So it was about saying, well, where are the loads actually travelling? How much stress is in that cross girder? You know, that that sort of thing. So um, so basically, we did that. We we had the consultant analyze the data using AS5100 approaches. Um, then we also refined the analysis to deviate a bit from away from the standard using actually. Uh, you know, actual acquired stress data for the bridge and the actual traffic counts that we had confirmed through actual counting of the traffic. So I guess the more, the closer we got to actual stresses and actual traffic loads allows it, allowed us to be more accurate in our analysis of fatigue life as well as dynamic amplification. So all of that process basically led to us identifying that uh, no members of the story bridge are fatigued and, and even the most critical members will not become fatigued for about another hundred years. 
um, which is a really good thing. So from an asset management perspective, it allows us to do some long-term planning um, around even those members that will become fatigued say, in 100 years' time. We don't need to intervene with those. Um, there are some areas we identified that could be in overstress um, under certain extreme loading scenarios, which will probably never eventuate, but it allows us to say, okay, well, rather than focus on fatigue, we can focus on strengthening certain members um, to address any theoretical overstress. So, so that's probably a quick snapshot of uh, the approach that we've taken on the story bridge. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Uh, you actually mentioned you you conducted both uh, visual inspection and HHM on the bridge. So can you comment on the effectiveness of structural monitoring in terms of the cost compared to the visual inspection, please? Yeah, absolutely. So the visual inspections, um, we follow the TMR structural inspection manual um, guide, which means that a visual inspection or a level one inspection, as we call it, has to occur on the bridge every year. Every five years, there's a level two inspection uh, and if needed, a level three inspection by an RPQ. So we, we do that regardless. That's that's going to be a part of our asset maintenance going forward forever and a day. Uh, in terms of uh, areas that we are concerned about in particular, uh, I think uh, the structural health monitoring allowed us to confirm that many of those areas that were theoretically you know, overstressed or fatigued didn't actually have a problem. Uh, so which means then that we're not spending additional money every year focusing on those or keeping sensors on them continuously. So I think an investment all up, I think it was about half a million dollars over about two or three years that we spent will probably, I'm just going to have a guess, it'll probably save us millions of dollars of unnecessary inspections going forward and certainly probably tens of millions of dollars of unnecessary work going forward in terms of adding any strengthening and so forth. Does that answer the question, Ronan? Yeah, 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 it's, it, it answers the question. Thank you so much. Um, sure. Actually, uh, I can see that structural health monitoring uh, can be applied to monitor the natural hazards and yeah, then provide resilience. So, um, Peter, can I ask you a question? As a leader of some project relating to this field, what have been some exciting developments that you have been involved in in recent years? Um, sure. I might also, if I may, just sort of um, contrast StoryBridge with the Sydney Harbour Bridge because they're both both using SHM, but they're quite different. Um, you know, quite different cases. And we found on the Harbour Bridge, it's the bridge deck that we were focused on particularly, uh, not the rest of the bridge. And straight away, you could realise that multiple SHM systems would be needed to monitor the whole bridge. But if we just look at the, the bridge deck, it's a, a 1,000 metres of bridge deck, um, half of which is suspended and half supported from below. Um, that structure, again, like story bridge, 1930s was when it was built over water, so exposed to the environment. Um, we did try to get some uh, uh, engineering analysis done, the FE modelling done uh, of the components that we we're monitoring and found that the structure was so old and so exposed um, to the weather that the FE models just weren't accurate. And the construction um, you know, standards, this was, uh, I mean, there's quite a lot of variation between the 800 structures we were actually monitoring. So, so in that particular case, what we did was put um, vibration sensors under the bridge and used a machine learning classifier to characterize normal behavior uh, and detect um, changes when they occurred. We couldn't do load testing. It's a bit impractical to shut that bridge down and, and run a truck over it. Um, but we uh, characterised and learned normal behaviour uh, and then over time uh, picked up uh, deterioration of specific components. So, you know, similar age, different sort of structure, different sort of approach to SHM. So the complementary, and I think most most times when you look at a population of assets, you might be looking at multiple types of SHM for different purposes. Uh, and in that case, a uh, remaining life estimate was pretty difficult, so it was really damage detection. On the on the resilient side, um, you know the objectives often are to keep the bridges open and available. And so, when we're looking at you know bridge availability and capacity, it really needs to be in the context of surrounding environment. So, uh, you know, if if the bridge was over water, being able to monitor scour. Um, you know, in, in a creek or a riverbed is going to be important, not just from the structural integrity of the bridge, but, you know, it supports. If it's, um, if we're worried about bushfires, then understanding the threat, you know, that fire presents around the structure is important. 
And, you know, if these bridges, and this is primarily bridges, if the bridges are in remote locations, then, you know, data communications um, and access is potentially an issue. So what it raises is the, I guess, the opportunity to have the bridge report on its own condition, but also report on the surrounding environment. And so what we really want to do is get a holistic view of that asset, um, you know, its current condition, what it's exposed to in terms of loading, um, and also threats from things like floods and fire. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Actually, Peter gave it a, a great example on how structural mooring can help to monitor the performance of norm, or normal operation of bridge, actually. And it not necessarily be, be used for detecting damage or, or, or defect on bridge. We can just use it as a, to, to assess the normal op, uh, operation of bridge. And Toro and Peter, actually, I mean, we can, with, um, yeah. With way in motion, you know, using these systems to do way in motion and understand yeah. loading, um, vehicle speeds, particularly on, on bridges which have got load limits. Um, if you do it over a period of time, then you can get an understanding of, um, you know, some estimation of remaining life from some of that history. Yeah, that's great, Peter. So uh, have you experienced any difficulty on implementing or managing the structural modeling system? on your on the harbor harbor bridge um i think the the challenges here you know for that bridge and all but then on, also for small bridges so local government operated bridges um is usually digital expertise in the organization i mean it's so for the small for councils it seems to be and isaac can correct me here if i'm wrong but from my experience that, that you know the assets are part of us they're looking at it as part of a smart infrastructure or smart city sort of strategy a lot of the skills are the same when it comes to sensing and data analysis and those sorts of things. Uh, but councils often lack the ability. So the large ones do. So, you know, Brisbane and Gold Coast, Sydney, um, some of the larger ones will be able to do it. But a lot of the other ones, and there's 400 odd councils in the country, really struggle with digital technology um, and understanding how to set these systems up, how to operate them, how to build a business case around them, how to interpret the data. Uh, and then more importantly, and this applies to large organisations too, uh, what changes to the organisation are needed to take advantage of the technology? Because this is digital transformation, you know, this is digital transformative technology. Um, to be truly transformative, it actually needs to transform business processes. And so, um, you know, everybody, you know, has got condition-based, or sorry, time-based maintenance scheduling um, to realise the full potential of this you know, we're moving, trying to move to a predictive or condition-based maintenance. That actually implies a change in, in organisational processes and skills. And so that's, to be, I think that's still to come in many cases. Yeah, thank Can you I for your in? Yeah, 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 please. Thanks. I, I think one of the, the, completely agree with what Peter said, that I, I think that there are, one of the challenges is, is linking this into the, the asset management decision-making cycle and the balance piece and how we can get good decisions made on uh, evidence. Um, and we've got to balance out, you know, if we use buzzwords such as cost risk performance. Um, and, you know, there, there's the step beyond when you put the instrumentation on and you get the data, but then how do you actually then interpret and use the data uh, in an easy way um, to make informed decisions. And I don't think we should undersell the effort that it takes to interpret and getting the right people who understand the data and how it informs into these decision-making processes. So I think um, for us, the, some of the, the challenges or the lessons learned we've learned out of this is that there's going to be a, some a degree of upskilling of people internally as well as industry as well uh, to exchange, you know, to to share the vision of what we're after to translate that into, well, how do you get that answer out of the instrumentation and the data that you're trying to capture? Um, so that I think that's a really key thing for us to, to to acknowledge the effort that's taken in between, and then how you how you continuously monitor that, and it takes effort and dedication to keep on using that data in your decision processes. Um, and that comes down to what you're trying to achieve. You know, we you could. If you're not careful, you could create the world's biggest monitoring system, <laughs> and it depends on the application of the asset and you know the risks that you're trying to manage or what the end answer. But you can have something very simple, 
something very, very simple to yeah. give you some very, um, you know, uh, objective data to help you make a call. And, and that's only one piece of it as well. We should remember that there's a whole range of different things you can use to make your asset management based decisions. Yeah. No, I just want to fully concur with that, Terrell, uh, same with, with Council. I think um, going into the application of SHM, I think the objectives have to be really clear and the objective can't be just that we want to use SHM. It's uh, what do we yeah. actually need at the end of this? What's the asset management benefit going to be at the end of this? Yeah, and then it has, I think, the most impact. Yeah. I think just to expand, expand it, especially on some of this, even though there's lots of challenges, I think one of the greatest things we've been able to employ in this space is the education. Um, and I was just going to circle back to the, um, you know, there's a conversation whether, you know, how difficult is it to implement some of this stuff internally for a government agency. One of the good things that we've been able to do is demonstrate the value of monitoring in, in, internally um, and even having simple things such as alerts that can come through to demonstrate well, why this matters and to raise awareness of things like, well, we have a bridge that's under stress. We are know from the analysis that we've done that there are some triggers in here that cause us very much discomfort. Here are the things that cause us the discomfort. Let's go away and try and manage the loading that's going across these structures. Um, it, and, that, and then there's a collaborative effort in managing a network because when you talk asset management, you're managing a corridor, you're not managing just a specific asset. It's there to provide the service, the level of the service that the community is expecting. So this is why bridge monitoring can help in that sort of evidence-based decision making. Yep, thank you. Uh, actually, I, I hope that in future we can have more guidelines on how to implement structural monitoring as well as how to overcome the difficulties. Uh, in this matter, maybe Professor Tommy Chen can comment on the progress of his uh, AS5100 on, on, on this well, formulation. Uh, I think for the, yes, for the uh, uh, guideline and specifications, Australian Network of Structural Health Monitoring considered that it's very important. At the moment, a lot of uh, recent issues, they are mainly caused by different expectations, or sometimes the service provider over promise what they could do. So I think all these uh, depends on the, um, uh, the correct expectations from the SHM system. So as I mentioned earlier, SHM include performance and damage detection, and also it's, I'm glad to see that um, there have been so many uh, projects that related as a champ. So I think the service provider, the government, and the Australian Network uh, of Structural Health Monitoring, together with other experts in the field, could work together to dem demonstrate okay, on how SHM can effectively deliver what it is expected. So to me, I really would like to see if. Um, we could have uh, some um, uh, collaboration between different parties and then to set aside fuel bridges or people to work on it and to demonstrate how it could work. So I think in Terrell or Isaac, they have already mentioned how to, uh, all these could be done. Maybe we could ask Yu Ching to give some comment on that as well. Yeah, Yu Ching, can you give some comment on that, please? Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Tommy Chen. Uh, I agree with most of you say, especially Dora have mentioned the structural health monitoring we need to have an expert, competent people, skillful people to drive the thing. The other thing is need to think about the software, the hardware, how to integrate to the asset owner. That is quite important. And in terms of the data, we need to really know what we want to achieve and what outcome we want. It's not just a structural health monitoring install. You can get everything, the data, but whether that is a useful data, that is really the outcome you want. We need to know the objective very well before come to the implement or using the structural health monitoring. In terms of your question, Professor Tommy Chen, how to do the cooperation, I guess it's like so many structure or critical structure from the asset owner. Maybe they can scope up the work and bring up the industry, academia, and asset owner work together and then demonstrate that this is a good system and moving forward. Thanks. 
Thank you. Uh, actually, we received some questions from the audience, and uh, we found that some of the questions has been addressed in uh, Professor Tommy Chen's presentation. So uh, they will not be asked again here. And due to the time constraint, I will just pick one question uh, from the audience. Uh, the question is, uh, can you share your experience on the application of optimization and machine learning in structural monitoring? Uh, Govinda, would you like to have with these questions? I think this, this is more sort of a, so, uh, thanks, Ron. This is more sort of a Peter yeah. question <laughs> than, than, than myself. Um, Peter, you want to have a, have a go at this? The machine learning. Yeah, yes, machine yeah. learning and optimization on structural monitoring. Um, sure. So, um, machine learning, there's different sorts of machine learning, but, uh, you know, I guess two examples are one is the one I just gave before where We've got um, sensors picking up vibrations, but there's no real way to model the vibrations accurately. So with the machine learning model, we use a, what's called a classifier to basically learn what normal vibrational behavior looks like. Uh, and in the case of the bridge I mentioned, you know, when a vehicle goes over a joint, um, then there's a, there's, a, um, there's a signal injected into the system and the vibrations um, react accordingly. Um, I, with many vehicles passing over the bridge, we can train a, a machine learning classifier to recognize what a bus looks like or what a car looks like. Um, but also when something changes, so if the, if the structure itself starts changing in some way, then uh, it will detect that, it will say something's wrong. So that's, that's one example of machine learning. Um, another example is uh, when we're looking at surface condition assessment. So, you know, if we're looking at, um, at, at um, steel structures, and Isaac mentioned the story bridge with the you know rust and corrosion. Uh, being able to do a automated um, visual analysis is quite useful when you're looking at rust and paint condition. And one way to do that is to train a, a camera system, not so much an RGB sort of camera, but a hyperspectral camera or a multispectral camera on um, different types of surfaces, and again train a classifier to recognise you know a condition for. Um, a condition one and a condition two and three, which are the four different conditions mm. of paint. Yeah. Uh, and then be able to automatically, you know, either fly a drone across or just take some imagery and have the system uh, recognize and, and report back on, you know, where, um, which parts of the bridge need the most attention. That's two examples. Yes. 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 I, I mentioned in my talk about uh, uh, using the laboratory model of the story bridge that we could use the optimization method to detect. So there are a lot of performance index and a lot of damage uh, uh, index, but all these index may not be sensitive to the change of the, um, the structural uh, uh, responses and all that. Some uh, optimization and machine learning are the two tools that could help to better uh, um, estimate uh, how sensitive are those index. So um, we have a lot of projects using machine learning, using damage detection, and also when we use the machine learning, one problem is about the data uh, we use to train the system. So we also develop some methods, even though we don't have enough data, we could either use um, FEA model to simulate, or there are also other methods that could be used to uh, uh, generate data for training and all that. So it's a very good topic. And I think um, if you are uh, interested on this topic, this book that uh, maybe you can see can that this is the book of that, uh, that we, we uh, the Ansem just delivered recently in July. So there are some chapters on machine learning and optimization. So uh, you could uh, uh, have a look. Uh, of these chapters and learn more about these. Can I, yeah. can I just jump so, in yeah, yeah, quickly? Um, I just wanted to flag that, um, I mean, these are all tools and techniques for us. What's really going to come down to is what, how you interpret and how you use this information. Um, and what's the, what's the consequence and the practicalities of the numbers that you're getting? Um, because, and I think this is why we need to have some, you know, the structural engineering aspect we shouldn't overlook about the engineering principles. All this digital information, the machine learning, the FEA, all that sort of thing, 
still needs to be married with the structural engineering principles that we're trying to manage for and then linking that into the asset and manager's decision making process about what represents good value how do we manage risk so i think um we, we shouldn't overlook that and we should be very um uh informed when we make these decisions because they all have consequences all, all decisions have consequences and so we just need to understand the tangibility and the real practicality of the data that we're collecting to use and I guess that's where the, um, the optimization tools can play a good role as a decision support tool because they help you sort of balance, you know, the, the, the result you want versus the cost often, you know, it's the, what's the cost to actually go out and do some repairs or do it now versus do it later. So um, at a particular portfolio level, that, those sorts of tools are going to be very valuable. The challenge there, I think, and I, I don't disagree, I think the challenge we've got with this and the collection of data and optimization tools is that they still are a black box. And I think we need to be very, very mindful of understanding what's in the black box. What are the assumptions that underpin you know, the algorithms that make decisions for us because we have lots of false positives and, and positive negatives and all these sorts of things that can skew us and stop us from being good engineers about making good engineering decisions. So I, I, I'm not disagreeing. I just think there's got to be some, some good yes. Practical application. Yeah. So if I can jump yes, in. I think um, yes, Corbina, you go first. Yeah. Right. So with with all this, so these days they talk about explainable explainable AI. So, so that sort of you know it's got to sort of somehow augment sort of physics into that and sort of get the benefits of AI as well. Just just to add uh, to this conversation. Um, so as a structural engineer, like you know, there's always two sides of. Uh, uh, equation. So one is the load side of the equation, another one is the, the capacity side. And uh, and with structural health monitoring, traditionally it's, it's, it has been focused on most of the capacity side, damage detection and all that. So I think there's a lot of value that we can sort of uh, tap into by just looking into the loading side of the equation. And, and, and most of the bridges that, the problematic bridges that we've come across, uh, they are sort of just related to sort of load rating, particularly under a very um, sort of extreme load combinations. So if we can um, sort of, uh, you know, collect data, not just from the bridges, because like if we put sensors on the bridges and the damage detection and all that after dam damage happens, it's already too late, right? So, so if you can sort of just get some lead indicators, whether that is through some sort of flood monitoring, you know, sort of getting that heads up, heads up around, you know, like, you know, when the peak is approaching, which is half an hour away or an hour away, so that we can sort of just stop the traffic just to avoid that uh, uh, peak flood coming together with the peak live loading events, or um, mm -hmm. just looking, that, looking at SHM as a more as a system, like we're not monitoring one particular bridge, but if you've got multiple bridges monitored in, in a network, so if uh, a heavy vehicle is coming from upstream, so then, you know, before it approaches a critical bridge, you know, you stop that vehicle prior to that. And also the camera technology that Toro was, was talking about, they're, they're quite quite valuable as well. So so one thing, is, as Peter mentioned, you know, just using the sensors uh, on the bridges themselves to provide adjacent data, but also augment with other data sets that we've got from, from, from other, other systems around, just essentially just like a, a, like a smart city concept with uh, with a network of, of data systems and, and data sets providing us the information to so that we can draw those insights from. That's a good point in terms of the system because we're often uh, bridges are connected to so many different things and I think about you know, we've been talking about the context of bridges but there's a whole lot of other infrastructure out there that benefits from acquisition of, of data and also good engineering and um, understanding the principles. So, you know, there's the geotechnical aspects, there's the marine infrastructure that's out there, um, pavement deterioration. Having, I mean, as a road agency, we collect a lot of data um, and we shouldn't forget to use the, how those pieces of data interact in decision making. So, you know, using the, the cameras, having, having a look at how we can capture images from road safety aspects that inform us. So I think there's, um, it was it said we're on the tip of the iceberg. I think it was you, Govinda, we're on the tip of the iceberg, you know, just in the precipice now of all the benefits of how we can manage and, and capture and use this data. I think the question then becomes how do we manage that data and that's probably a topic for another time. <laughs> we capture that. Can I, I'll, 
I'm just thinking, Toral, as you say, that, that maybe that's the challenge from us asset owners to the industry is um, maybe that's probably a bit more convincing that we need is, um, you know, we get all this really good data, but how can we be convinced, um, you know, to, that it, it, it's going to be useful to us and that we're going to be able to harness the, yes. the benefit of that effectively and easily, yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, that, and so it's out of the tips and making good decisions. Absolutely. Mm. All right. So thank you for a wonderful discussion about the application of machine learning and optimization. Um, I, I, I may have a kind of different uh, questions on the government in recognition of the value of structural monitoring. So, uh, Eugene, uh, can you comment on whether the government recognize the value of Bits or to be used in, in infrastructures? Uh, good question. The short answer is yes. They recognize the value. In Victoria, the Department of Transport, they have been using the structural health monitoring for monitoring the critical structure. They also use it for the super load uh, carrying the generator crossing over the structure so they has been using for a while the government definitely see that is a value but agree with isaac and Dora say based on the data how to manage or get the benefit that data for the application and the other thing is uh, the challenging is always is come to this how to storage the data as well so right now got the cyber tech attack as well you need to think the other way is how to do the security for the data as well is that data is a sensitive or the data is a useful from that perspective yeah thanks Lauren. all right thank you uh thank you um due to the time constraint actually i just would like to give uh one last question to professor tommy chen so as the president of australian network of structural monitoring what would be your plan to better promote structural monitoring to wider user in australia yeah. <laughs> it's a quick question. It took me a long yeah, time to yeah, do it. But yeah. anyway, I just tried to summarize all, all what we have discussed earlier. It just seems that um, for the government, for the asset owner, they, what they are looking for is something to assist them for the management, as well as to ensure the operation of the structure is working fine. And also, SHM is not only uh applying to uh, bridges it could also be applied to buildings so i i also realized that in because of what has happened in opal tower or other buildings in sydney so uh, a lot of the body corporate and also they are looking for uh some system to assist their management as well as for for the op uh, or the buildings operation maybe they will use enm so i think to me as an um, as a, um, uh, President, what I we, we would like to do to use Ansem as a platform so that we could work together. So for the government, we know what they need. And then we just try to see, say, if Eugene mentioned about some uh, earlier about software and, and also Torel mentioned about something that some um, uh, guideline, some um, vet, uh, indicator for that. So all these, I think Ansem could help. We have uh, 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 expert in there as well as we could work with the industry uh, because most often, we are not service provider. We could develop, but we could work with the uh, uh, industry for the service provider so that we can provide what it needs for the uh, uh, asset owner. And then another thing is at the moment is a, a lot of people, they may have different expectations of SHM. I think Ensign will try to have more forum to educate and also to train more graduate to meet the needs of the field. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, for those engineers working at the moment, they have not been taught as a champ in their undergraduate course. So I think mm, that's the past. Let it be gone, be, be gone. So what we would try to do is in the university, we would try to provide a, a more courses on as a champ and, and, this, and the other thing the third about you know, um, research and development, as I mentioned earlier, it would be good that we could so you turn has responded that as that's good that we may have some mm, structures I, uh, identified so that we could work together to demonstrate as well as providing some expectations some specifications and how this could be used 
for managing the asset so or how we can make the decisions and i think that's what ansem is going to work on uh, and we that's our plan for the future okay thank you stormy and uh, as well all the panelists for sharing your experience and solution for widening the adoption of structural monitoring especially in australia actually we couldn't answer all the questions from uh, the audience and well from the panelists however there is not a chance actually for us for to continue our discussion uh, in the forthcoming 14 and some workshop to be held on 24 and 25th of november this year uh, which was introduced in the second last slide of professor mi chen uh, talk so please uh, refer to that slide and registers before the 18th of November. So uh, I guess that's all the time we have for today. So please join me once again in thanking Professor Tommy Chen, uh, Dr. Toro Pep, Dr. Eugene Kwai, Mr. Isaac Scott, Dr. Govinda Pandey, and Mr. Peter Runcis for their time and input. I would like to thank Australia, uh, Engineers Australia's industry partners, Queensland University of Technologies for their support. I would like to thank all the audience for joining us today and please complete a soft feedback form, which is linked in the description box below to help us improve and plan future sections. Thank you again, and we hope to see you at our next Talks Leaders event. Thank you.